Hi, everyone. Welcome to journey number 36. Today, I'm joined by Justin Peters. I'm really excited for this conversation. I think we have a couple parallels and um, are doing some actually similar things, I believe. So happy to have you here, Justin. And, um, you know, to start off the show, I'd just love for you to kind of introduce yourself, you know, uh, a little bit about yourself, what you're doing, um, where you're from, everything like that, kind of whatever comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. First off, Jared, thanks so much for creating the space to have me on your show. Um, super excited to have this conversation as well. I know, know a little bit about your background and it seems like we do run somewhat of a parallel journey throughout our twenties here. So I'm sure we'll jump into that. But for, for those that don't know me, um, Justin Peters, I reside in Austin, Texas. And, um, I guess by date I work, I work in financial services and by night, my side project, I am the founder and host of the struggles real podcast. Awesome. Um, you know, one thing that I'm always curious about, and it's just, you know, it's come up for me over and over again is, uh, learning about people, what they were like as a child. Yeah. Um, you know, because I think there's so many themes that carry on from childhood into our adult lives. And so, uh, I, yeah, just out of curiosity, you know, what were you like as a child? Um, what was your dream job growing up? Um, yeah, just kind of any, any memories or, or things that pop up for you. I just, I'm always so curious. Yeah. I, I think this is actually a great place for us to start this conversation. Cause I think I'm going to link it all the way back to the struggle is real and how we got to where I was there. But as a child, I've always been achievement driven. Um, that's probably coming from my parents. They would, I would say that both my parents were semi laissez faire or avoidant in their parental style. And the one area that my siblings and I could always get their attention and was achievement focused things. So that's report report cards and or sports. We always connected in those certain areas. So I always found myself wanting to excel in some of those pieces. I brought that achievement through um, high school, ended up playing college soccer as well. And um, I think like most people, this is probably going to some hopefully sound really familiar to a lot of people's stories, but went into college kind of knowing what I wanted to do, or at least thinking that I knew exactly what I wanted to do and then changing my mind, but never really thinking from the fact that like, I had no idea the journey that was going to be, I was going to be on after college or post-college. I found myself in an internship my sophomore year, and I thought that was it. Like I was really making, I was making some really great strides. And I think if I looked back on it, it was because once again, I was a high performer in this organization. They really looked up to me and I felt valued there. So I continued that journey for seven years, but then in my mid twenties, I think like most people kind of just had this quarter life crisis and wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do with my career, where I was headed, what direction I wanted. And I was going around in circles all the time about, about this piece in particular. And I ended up leaving my, I ended up leaving that position, jumped to another position. And I quickly found out that wasn't the right fit for me. It was kind of that grass isn't greener on the other side situation where I, I thought making this change would be everything that I wanted, but ended uh, found myself five months later, leaving that job, creating a sabbatical for myself to really just give myself some white space to pursue um, really what I wanted to do with my career. So that was having conversations and pursuing some of these other side projects or goals that I had in mind, um, did that for six months and eventually came back around to the professional workforce. But through all of that, learned a lot of ups and downs, and I'm still kind of in the middle of that journey, honestly, right now. But one thing in particular that I really didn't learn is like, this clock doesn't end at 30. And I feel like so many of us 20-somethings, especially early on in our 20s, think that we have this runway up to up into our 30s. And if we're not what we designated ourselves to be throughout our young 20s at the age of 30, if it was that successful business owner or high-level executive or professional artist or sports player, whatever it may be, then our, our life is a fail. And one thing that I've learned um, extensively through the podcast was there's so much more runway after your thirties, and there's probably got to be moments of reinvention between now and then as well. For sure. And there's so many things that you just touched on there that I want to come back to, but I think the first one, and you know, it might be, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit vulnerable and maybe something that you actually haven't put a lot of thought into, but you know, that idea of, you know, needing achievement to, you know, get the attention of your parents. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious, you know, like if you've done any work on that and how, you know, it, if there's an understanding, has it always kind of been, you know, you've been able to balance it. And so it hasn't gotten out of hand. Like for me, very similar, um, where it was something that I could point to, of like, you know, it is something tangible there that I can say, oh, hey, look, I achieved this. 
And, um, you know, the funny thing is it actually wasn't noticed too much by my parents, but for whatever reason, as a child, I decided that is how I'm going to show my worth to everybody Mm -hmm. else. And so it led to a lot of me, you know, needing to achieve, needing me to, you know, be, you know, quote unquote successful to show other people, you know, like this is my worth. And it, it led to a lot of professional success. And at the same time, it led to a lot of mental unhappiness because I wasn't aware that that's what I was doing. And so I'm just more curious on, you know, how you think about that now and has that evolved over time or yeah, just your, your kind of experience with it. No, I think that's a really good thought. I would similar my feelings in that. I think it started with my parents, but ultimately this same sense of how I want to present myself to the outward world um, as this, you know, professional and and making some big strides in my career because after college ends, grades are gone and sports were gone for me both. So that only left one really big avenue for me to prove some of my self-worth or self-worth or what I thought should be what my self-worth is centered around. Um, and that was my career. And my parents are really big on, on their career as well. Like if all else fails, as long as you're working, then they're pretty satisfied with you. They want you to be able to pay your bills and they want to see forward progress in your career itself. No shame on them. I think most parents are are probably aligned this way as well. And it was probably a little bit of both myself and my parents that are putting that pressure on them. I think at this point in time, I've made a change in my career and my parents have been supportive of that change. I haven't worked for six months at one point in time and they were supportive of that time. But ultimately, I felt like they wouldn't have been supportive of that. Have I done a lot of work around those thoughts? I think just naturally being curious around brain and psychology and attachment theory and a lot of those interesting um, subject matters. I think spending some time there and thinking through those things, I hopefully have improved my same line of thinking um, for myself, but having the conversation with my parents around what that might be is still something that I would like to do at some point in time. I'm just not there yet. Oh, for sure. And I mean, I think that's a very tough conversation for everybody to have. And, you know, for me being honest, I haven't actually had that conversation with my parents and Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, the approach that I've taken is I have done a lot of that work on my own and, you know, for multiple of different reasons of, you know, I, I tell myself whether it's true or not, that I don't know if they'd be able, able to, you know, even have that conversation. I don't know if it would lead to the results that I would want, you know, a whole bunch of things like that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in doing that work on your own um, and not requiring it to be a conversation right up front. Uh, definitely, you know, a nice conversation to have and one that if you feel comfortable and are able to have with your parents is amazing, but one that I haven't myself had either. Yeah, uh, it's just, it, it's tough though, too. I, I think finally allowing myself to make that, to, to move out of that career where I, I could have probably easily seen a line into becoming a vice president and then eventually the president or some kind of executive in that and deciding just to blow that all up similar to your story where like you were in this uh in an industry and pretty successful and then all of a sudden you decided to blow that up and I I I believe you essentially became like a bar back out of that right (laughs) or like a serp like a server essentially like it I did you feel like you took a step backwards in that sense um I mean yes and no right it was it was very you, you did some research. You definitely did your research. On that. <laughs> um, yeah, but essentially it went from, you know, like being a part owner, being a manager of a restaurant uh, mm-hmm. to getting a job as, yeah, like a server assistant, just like busboy cleaning tables. And um, yes, a step back. The, the really interesting part for me was that even though professionally it was the lowest I had ever been, uh, mentally it was the best that I felt. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I I, what I would tell myself during that time was I would tell myself the story and almost romanticize the story of like, this will be great telling people one day, right. Of, you know, I went from here to there and then, you know, almost thinking of it as like the build up to what I'm going to achieve. And I'm like, this is a great beginning to a story. And I'd have to go over and over and over again in my head to, and tell myself that. Because, and that's really what I think got me through it. Mm. Other, other people's stories actually gave me the, tr- the courage to make that, that change as well. I, it was a big piece for me just listening to some other people and them being lost in throughout their 20s or 30s at the certain inflection point of their career, and then finally deciding to pull the trigger regardless of what their parents thought, what their peers thought, what their spouse thought in some situations. And then 
obviously getting the benefit of, you know, 20 or 25 year stretch from there and getting to see where that decision made and how that led to the success that they're at now. I think looking back on, I never really thought about it. I think listening to so, so many of those stories allowed me to make that decision on my, my own as well. Yeah. And, you know, I'm curious, thinking back on it, is there a specific one that stands out most for you or, you know, either a story that you heard or was there a specific moment where it just kind of clicked or was it more of a slow build where just like you felt a building, 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 and then you were able to finally kind of make the jump to make that decision? Yeah. Um, two decisions are coming to mind. I think let's focus on, on one decision. I think that was probably one of my most important looking back retrospectively, but at the time didn't really think too much of it. So born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, spent 25 years there. And finally, this was January, 2018. Um, I'm a big goal, big time goal setter. I have a master list of things that I eventually love to do. And I usually at the beginning of every year, pick four or five things off that list that I really want to focus on this year and move out of St. Louis had been on that list for quite some time. And it got on that list actually through my career. I was working in insurance at that time and For people that don't know, the insurance industry is super old, especially on the side that I was on, being on the brokerage side, I would say the average age was probably 55. So I worked with many people that were um, plus 55 years old. And one thing that I often get to talk to them about was, you know, what, how would you have liked to spend your 20s? Like, what regrets do you have? Um, And more times than not, moving out of St. Louis and or just curiosity in general was like the major theme to it. So I took a lot of heart to that. And every year since then, I had passed on that. I was like, you know what, it's not the right time for me to move out of St. Louis either. I was finishing up school, wasn't there financially. I was in a relationship until 2018 came. And I looked at that one and I was like, oh, like, I don't have any like hard nose against this one. Like is 2018 got to be the year that I actually have the courage to move out of my hometown. And after about a week or two of thinking, I was like, yep, totally is. So I booked a trip um, out to California. I wanted to go and check out a few places there and see if maybe that would be a potential fit for me. Um, So I took a road trip and finally ultimately decided that San Diego was going to be, was, was going to be where I was going to move to. So that was the easy part. I decided that in April of 2018, um, moved out September 20 of 18. And throughout that whole next couple months, it was all of these decisions that started to bubble up. Um, And one of those was my career and really kind of rethinking my career. And before I had the conversation with my boss as well, I was kind of back of the head, like, okay, I'm going to be making this change. Like I'm moving out of St. Louis. I'm going to have to leave this job. At that time, remote work wasn't really a thing. We had like three people in the organization that was working remote out of like 250. I'm pretty, like, I thought I was going to tell my boss and um, that was going to be it. But when I had that conversation, he asked me if I would be interested in working remote. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. And I said, yes, initially based off of so many, just like realist um, thoughts of my own, like, okay, I'm going to move to this new city and I'm going to upset everything, friends, hobbies, what, you know, even my grocery stores, it'd be nice to have one constant in my life. You know, I, I, it'd be nice to, to not have to change or be looking for a career during that, you know, early lust of moving to a new city and really getting to experience that city. I liked that decision, but ultimately after that three months and and I started to really get into my routine of my new city, I realized I was kind of disappointed in how that all happened because I thought that was going to be the out for me to allow myself to start exploring a different career. And I told myself so many times like, okay, I'm after this, I'm, you know, here's a list of some other things I'd like to potentially try. I've been having that conversation with myself about me being unemployed at that, 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 um, particular time that I started to build some excitement around exploring a different area. And, um, I ended up staying remote, working remote for that company for another year. And eventually, like I said, pulled the trigger, went to that other organization, made a quick change, and then realized I just needed to create a whole white space in itself and just like restart this entire thinking process. For sure. I love that. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious to, were, are, have you thought, uh, thought about where the root of that pull to move out of Missouri came from, right? Like I've, you know, I've heard from talking to other people, sometimes it's just the new adventure. Sometimes it's wanting change. Sometimes it is, you know, mo- physically moving allows you to reinvent yourself of you don't have the history of this is who Justin has been for 25 yep. years. I think you said that you were there, um, yep. you know, looking back on that, do you know what that was for you? Like, what was that driving force or that deep down desire that, you know, made you want to move? 
Yeah, I I would agree with the points that you just made there. I think it was probably a multiple multitude of those different factors. One being I in 2015 went on my first international trip and then kind of realized the power of traveling and what that could do for you. So there was always a little bit of that for me where, you know, even more so traveling, moving to a new city, what could that end up doing for me? So there was that piece to it. But I think the largest underlying factor was probably this whole reinvention piece to it. And, and also just like shedding all of your current obligations, because being born or raised somewhere, you're carrying elementary, middle school, high school, college friendships with you. And you have so many obligations and people that you know, and, and people learn or people grow throughout their 20s too. And I wasn't necessarily aligning with some of the people that I'd spent a lot of time with in St. Louis. So between that and just kind of being able to reset myself and also reinvent myself, I had like this really strong desire to just go there and like start with a blank piece of paper. Um, you know, I get to decide all of my friends, who all my friends were going to be moving forward from there. I was got to do the whole job change. I was also got to be able to kind of set a new rhythm and routine for just my daily life in San Diego as well. So I think it was a little bit of all of those. So cool. Um, I'm, I'm curious, have you moved? Cause you're Canadian, right? Have you ended up, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, it's funny where, so I'm from Calgary, Alberta and um, I have never had the desire to move and I don't know why it is. This is just home for me. And, you know, it might be deep down that I have some things tying me here that I I'm afraid to let go of. Um, but I haven't dug too much into it. And it's funny because I, I never even had the bug to travel. And, you know, I was extremely lucky with one of the jobs that I had in uh, 2019, like I traveled all over the world, you know, and so in a single year, I did New York twice, Vegas twice, uh, Germany, London, England, I went to Dubai for a month, like I got to travel and see the whole world and, um, but it was for work and I loved that. I was like, this is great. Like if for me taking a vacation, I'm like, oh, I don't know, that doesn't sound too good. But if I have something that keeps me (laughs) busy for most of the day and I can go explore afterwards, that's what I love. And I really cherish those memories of, um, you know, traveling and experiencing new places. But again, this has always just felt like home. Uh, New York was probably the first place that I went to where I was like, oh, I could see myself living here. Um, And actually strongly considered moving, um, you know, earlier this year, but uh, ultimately just decided that I want to stay in Calgary for the time being. And that doesn't mean that I'll never move. Um, and I think that I will, and I would love to travel more for work. Um, but I think Calgary will always be my home base. And, you know, I haven't been able to figure out why, but I'm okay with that too. So I'm so curious, what, what was interesting or appealing about New York for you? It was so funny. I'd always laugh at people, you know, they just talk about the energy, right? It's like, they're just an energy in New York. <laughs> no, <I'm> like, okay. <laughs> yeah. What if you say, and then you get there and you're like, oh wait, no, I get it now. <laughs> right. And um, I just, I love being busy. I love the busyness, like all the people um, that honestly, there wasn't much more than that. I just really loved that feeling. And, you know, you could just feel the opportunity. You could feel um, how many different types of people there were, how much opportunity there is. And, um, yeah, I think those were the major, major forces for me. So, yeah. Energy is such a tough one to pinpoint on. Like if I, if somebody hasn't done a lot of traveling and, or moved out of their hometown too, it's really hard to articulate what I'm like looking for. Cause people often ask me now, you know, which one did you like more San Diego or, or Austin? And I go down that energy, you know, discussion as well. And I could tell it doesn't resonate with some. And then other people are like, yeah, I totally get it. You know what I mean? I have to say anything else. My girlfriend um, lived in New York City for a couple of years, and she often mentions the energy of New York. And it's very interesting, very polar opposite of San Diego, this laid back surfing town um, versus like this type A, really heavy driven (laughs) New York City. But she loves that too. She loved just walking out of her front door um, you know, walking out of the apartment and there's like energy already just like protruding through her. And so many people are excited about the opportunities ahead of their, in their life. And I was, didn't realize I was missing that. And that was one major change that from going from San Diego to Austin, because Austin has this very early Silicon Valley type feel. And there's a lot of people, I, I liked San Diego for its laid backness and that people weren't hundred percent wrapped up in their identity around their work, you know, they had hobbies outside of that, but it was almost too far on the other side of the pendulum where there wasn't a lot of anticipation or excitement for what was ahead. It was really so more so like very present in the fact that like, I'm trying to catch 
the afternoon surf this afternoon. So like, how can I make sure I get out at three o'clock today <laughs> versus like, I need to stick around here for a little bit longer because I'm working on this project that might lead to this deal that might get to me, get to this piece to it. So it was really interesting spending time both in San Diego and then, you know, California's counterparts like LA and San Francisco have the very opposite where, like I said, it, everybody's wrapped up to what's, what's in the future for them. Austin's a really nice medium between the two. Like people are excited about what they're doing with their careers, with their businesses, et cetera. But people also have lives outside of that. They, they like to talk about their family. They like to talk about their hobbies. They like to talk about, you know, here in Austin, particularly the, the food spot that they went to. Um, so it's, it's really, I think, fascinating to look at. No, that's really cool. And, you know, I think it, you articulated it really well. Uh, you know, just those different energies and the differences between them. And I think that that's why I resonated a lot with New York, because I've always been very different, right? And like, I just like to keep busy. I've always been busy, like, through my entire life. And, you know, starting in university when I was a full-time student. Um, and, you know, I played a couple of years of football after, um, after high school. And so, you know, I had five courses, full course load in class five days a week. Then I'd go to football practice for five hours, six out of seven days a week. <laughs> right? And that's where I started. Then I got into work and like learned how much I love entrepreneurship. And, um, you know, it also allowed me to be competitive in a different way and, you know, like kind of reap the fruits of my labor, where as much work as I put in is how much I'm going to get out. And, you know, that's, that's the interesting thing for me. And I always tell people I'm a little bit crazy, but, you know, like I enjoy work. Uh, but it also comes with the fact that I need to be doing something that I enjoy because if I don't, then I am the worst employee you've ever met in your entire life, <laughs> but you know, like, and I'll do, but when I'm working on a project that I truly believe in and that I want to be, you know, working at, you know, 12, 14, 16 hour days, no problem. Like seven days a week, of course, like, what do you mean a weekend? <laughs> right? But it is almost a hobby for me. And, you know, I'm very all or nothing, like very much so hundred miles an hour or nothing, right? I'm either going, doing things, you know, out and about working, or I'm slothing on my couch, not doing anything, watching TV. And that's just kind of how I've always operated. Um, and have had to do a little bit of work too around, you know, asking myself, what are my motivations for that? Why am I doing that? Um, I've switched a lot of that over the last couple of years and doing it in a lot more of a healthy way now um, and not judging it either of, you know, and not trying to impose it on other people. Mm. So. I, that's a crux for so many 20 somethings, to be honest. I saw myself go through that. I am seeing my brother go through this. I see so many of my friends either on somewhat of this journey of, especially these like um, high self achievers that are go, go, go. And they like to perform at a higher octane than I would say most people, but then you're right. Then they run into this collision with an unfulfilling career or an unfilling, unfulfilling job. And then it's really hard for us to move forward or move past that because you're right. It is, it's hard for us to sit on our hands and not be excited about what we're doing every single day. But then at the same time, the only thing worse than that is to be putting a bunch of energy um, into something that we don't find fulfilling at all. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm, I've been still trying to massage that out and figure out what the best case is for that. Because like I said, I have so many of my peers that are asking me about that or going through this. And at the end of the day, you know, a lot of like the underlying, it, the major underlying issue for, for so many of these top level um, discussions that I have is this, this incongruence between the energy you want to put in and what you want to put that energy in towards. So I don't know, I'm, I'm still kind of trying to sort through that. <laughs> For sure. You know, and I got a little bit of clarity over or through it um, because of COVID. And it was very interesting because again, like, you know, I'd just been go, go, go my entire life. And this was the first time that I was forced to like, no, <laughs> you can't do anything. Like you are there, you need, you're going to be at home. You're going to be you know, in your, basically I tell people, I basically locked myself in my room for three months and like had to figure my shit out in my head. And, uh, you know, it was a blessing and a curse. And luckily I had started doing a lot of personal development work and, you know, really looking at my mental health and seeing where a lot of those motivations came from right beforehand. And that kind of just amplified it because like, oh, now I don't have anything to distract myself by. Um, and that really is where it goes back to uh, what we talked about earlier in the conversation of like, what were my motivations? And I realized that, you know, my entire life, my motivations had been proving my worth. 
And that led to a lot of not being fulfilled. And it was very interesting because, you know, from the outside looking in, it was, you know, you've achieved this, you've achieved this and, um, you know, people congratulating or like looking up or like, wow, like that's so amazing. Um, on the inside though, feeling empty. Right. And then telling myself, oh, once I get to this point, you know, then I'll be happy. Then I can, you know, celebrating it, Ce sorry, celebrate it. And then you get there and you're like, oh, I don't actually feel any different. I know what the problem is. I didn't set my, my sights high enough. So I'm going to set yeah. them up here and same sort of thing. And every single time, you know, I met one of those milestones again, I would, I'd find myself being there like, oh, I actually don't feel any different. Um, and that's where, you know, again, so realizing that I'll never be able to prove my worth to other people. I have to find it for myself. And then having like many hard conversations with myself of, are these the things that I actually want to be doing? Like, do I actually enjoy working or is that the, the reason why I have? And so over a year, you know, two years, I finally found that, okay, no, I do actually enjoy this. And um, I need to switch where my motivations are coming from. I can still be a high achiever. I can still, you know, enjoy work and I can do it for myself instead of for others. And that was kind of the unlock for me. Yeah. So I took my sabbatical started in January, 2020. So I quit that job that I was at for five months in January, 2020, didn't start work again until September of 2020. So actually it's probably a little bit more than six months, but something I learned through my sabbatical was kind of unpacking or, um, unattaching some of these outputs that you do attach to your job. First and foremost, your job for, for majority of people is what pays the bills. And I think that your job should be primarily driven for that. And people can disagree, but I am also a big believer that you can find some of these other outputs in more efficient ways. So um, something like purpose and fulfillment for me, I realized that I could start this thing that I call the struggle is real podcast and find a lot of sense of purpose and fulfillment through this project. And that for me alleviated some of the need that my career had to pick up for having some kind of purpose in my life and vice versa. I don't need to monetize my podcast because my career is picking up the um, really the bag for, for that piece to it. And it's really paying my bills and acting as a primary vehicle for that. Not saying that people shouldn't try to align their careers with what they want to do. If you absolutely dread going into work every single day, then I really do think it might be a time to rethink that. And rethinking that could be one of two things. And I, I see this mistake in a lot of 20 somethings. The, the, the first place and obvious place, it could be changing jobs. But um, the other aspect you could potentially look at and that I often overlooked was changing my, my job internally. It's more so looking at what I don't like about my job and figuring out, can I delegate? Can I automate? Can I um, just have a conversation with my manager and, and maybe that's no longer needed and or might be better fit for somebody else's desk. And then articulating to yourself and to your peers and to your manager as well, what really brings you fulfillment about your current job? Because truth be told, everybody has a little bit of crap and a lot of, and some things that they really enjoy about their job. And the ultimate goal is to figure out how can I do more of what I really like to do? And how can I do less of what I really don't like to do? And sometimes there can be an internal shift in instead of this entire external shift of going and finding a new job and and kind of resetting in, in that sense, because then you find out once you get settled into that job too, man, there's some crap that I hate about this job as well. <laughs> and, and that is the journey of a 20 something. Honestly, we get to take, you know, two or three or four jobs. And I, and I'm also a really big believer in using your, your twenties for curiosity and not judging yourself for changing jobs. If it's, if you get to the five month mark and you're like, God, I freaking hate this, but you don't want the blemish on your resume. So you're, you know, trying to make it to this one year mark so that you have a storyline built for it screw that line of thinking, just move on and, and find another job. I, I think I'd rather see somebody trying things over and over and over throughout their twenties. And so that they could find what they really want to do throughout the you know remaining years of their career versus somebody being stuck into their job all throughout their twenties. And now they're in their mid thirties or mid forties, or maybe even their mid fifties, like, holy shit, I didn't want to do, I don't want to do what I'm currently doing. And I honestly haven't wanted, haven't wanted to do it for the last 15, 20, 25 years. Um, I hope that we can start changing the storyline that society tries to tell us around that. Like 20 somethings are supposed to be moving 
in on exactly what they're, they're supposed to be doing for the rest of their career. I'd rather see it as, hey, these next 10 years, go try a bunch of different things. Go see what resonates with you. You can always come back to something too. I've made a full circle and I've actually, I'm working from one of my old bosses that I was at for, at my very original job. Um, I come with a new sense of what I want out of my, my job and my career at that certain time because of the couple stops that I've made whenever I was on, um, on that leave from her. She finds me as a more productive employee because of that. She knows how to tailor my, uh, my job more so better because of I, have, I can articulate what I'm missing or what I've seen in other companies that I really enjoy and don't enjoy. So long rant <laughs> on, on that piece to it. But man, I have just been having so many conversations about this recently. And um, hopefully we'll get to talk to it at the end as well. But if at some point in time, you are just stuck in your job because maybe you're not in the position, the privileged position that you and I were in to take a step backwards. And I don't know about you, but I cut my salary in half. Um, leaving one job and taking that sabbatical and then going stepping into another role because of course I was looking for a job July 2020 um, some of the like the worst time to be on the job market um, with COVID like just wreaking havoc on everything and I ended up taking another job but that job did exactly what I needed it to do it gave me so much more clarity um, on some of the conversations I'd been having during my my sabbatical of where I could potentially take it I jumped into that role allowed myself to, to be in that role for a little while and learn so many new things that I really got excited about in my career. Um, so if you are stuck in, and you just can't move because maybe money is the major constraint, then I think utilizing some of the other aspect or some of your other um, hours, um, I, I you know talk about this 168 hours in a week, um, 24 times seven, let's give it eight hours a day for sleep, we're down to 112 hours. 12, let's just give those 12 hours to maintenance. You got to groom yourself and you got to feed yourself. So we got hundred hours left in our week. And, and granted, I know all hundred hours of these hours might be different for, for other people like um, parents. I get it. You got to spend some time with your kids and um, you got to recoup. Uh, there's some people that do work multiple jobs and 40 hours a week. Isn't uh, necessarily the amount of hours that they work, but let's just stay on the storyline that you work 40 hours a week. That means you have 60 other hours left in your week to, to utilize however you want to utilize. That's one and a half other careers that, that you could be making um, outside of your own job. And let's be honest, <laughs> uh, 40 hours a week is probably more so like 25 hours a week. We all find that there's probably some fat to trim in our own our job. Um, and there's things that don't, don't necessarily need to happen. So like you and I, we both found a side project to go and um, pursue and start building other other skills like this. Sure, there's some transferable skills podcasting gives me for my my you know day job. But at the same time, I'm exploring so many other areas. I, I didn't know anything about media. I didn't know a whole lot about marketing. I didn't really know that much about driving a conversation, being a host, the technical side of podcasting. Everything that this side project, which is probably about 15 to 20 hours in my week, um, uh, week over week, has given me has been incredible actually fuel my career as well. So it might just be another thought for people out there. There's so many other avenues that you can take outside of just, you know, quitting your current job and finding a new one. For sure. And, you know, I couldn't agree more with uh, trying a bunch of different jobs, like, especially when you're young. And, you know, for me, one of the biggest pieces in that is I really do look at those skills that you learn, even if it's the same or a similar position, but at a different company, you learn different skills and things that you might not even pick up on, right? Little nuances, uh, either specifically with the job or with the people that you meet, or you might make a new connection. And, you know, the idea that it's not just wasting your time if you don't find your forever job. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but I think it goes back to, you know, the whole conversation about like 30 being this huge number and this huge um, thing that gives so many people anxiety and, you know, quarter life crisis is the more that I talk to people. And, you know, I went into mine, I'm like, I'm the only person that's ever had one of these. I'm going to coin the term quarter life crisis. Like, this is going to be great. <laughs> Talking to other people. I was just like, oh no, you had one, you had one, you had one, you had one. Okay. Like interesting. This is actually a common theme. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but for me, I believe that that has kind of come from a place where in our parents' generation, you know, and you always heard about the midlife crisis, but, um, you know, the story, especially that I was told over and over again, and a lot of people, you know, similar to our age, were told by our parents is um, you go to school, you get a job, 
you get married, you buy a house and you retire. And that is, that is what you're working towards. That is your life trajectory. And the sooner you can find that job, the sooner you can retire. And for whatever reason, like I always rebelled against that. I was like, that's stupid. I don't want that. Like, that sounds terrible to me. (laughs) Right. But I think, you know, as I've looked at it more, looking back on, you know, call it our parents' generation, stability was super important and it was not necessarily the most stable of times. And so they needed that stability. They, you know, it didn't matter if you were fulfilled at work, uh, you needed stability, you need to put food on the table. Whereas our generation has a lot of that macro stability, you know? Um, and so we are looking for fulfillment. And I think that's just accelerated uh, you know, those, you know, called crises of, um, you know, it's happening earlier because we're not we're as worried about that stability. So, you know, those feelings start to bubble up a lot earlier. And I think there are a lot of the same feelings that, you know, the generations before us had, again, they're just happening earlier. Do you think that that's maybe where those are coming from, or do you have a different take on it? No, I think I would agree with all of what you were saying, to be honest. I, maybe our parents were driven by hitting a certain career milestone, if that was a title that they were looking for and or a certain amount of money that they were making. As you were mentioning, we might have more flexibility on that, especially with multiple streams of income and the rise of freelancers and and solo entrepreneurs kind of gives a whole new definition of that. But what's really bubbled up on all this is, is impact, like making an impact and how much impact can I make? And, you know, just using the 30s thesis here, I want to make this impact by 30. Mm -hmm. And then so many of us start seeing the days dwindle between now and 30 and the actual impact that we're making and get nervous around that. It's, it's really hard as a podcaster and we can kind of talk like downloads. It's really hard to ignore downloads or listens um, because we start judging ourselves on, on this vanity metric and we tie that vanity metric to the impact that we want to make. So if you haven't put a lot of clarity around what impact means for you, then you'll always default to the vanity metric of whatever you're chasing. If that is money or sales or customers or, um, you know, amount of socks donated or whatever it may be. Um, so I think putting some thought into that, having some realistic expectations. So for me with, with the podcast in particular, I, <laughs> drug my feet on podcasting, actually, I bought mics and um, told myself that whole time all through 2019, I was going to start a podcast. And it took me eight months until the start of January 2020, when I was remaking my goals like I do every year and saw that, that, that you know, start a podcast on my, my goal list, realized, wow, I bought mics in April and I never ended up recording a single episode. <laughs> let's, let's focus on that goal this year. And what would that mean? Um, and the only thing I've really done with podcasting between April and January of 2020 was start to get curious around the industry. So I started reading some articles and I came across this, this terminology called pod fading. And I don't, I don't know if you've heard this, but essentially the thesis is um, most people stop recording episodes after episode seven, like 50% or something crazy like that. A podcast stop producing after episode seven, they, um, and, and, their logic or their line of thinking was essentially they, they didn't see the impact early on. They, they didn't get the amount of listeners or downloads that they were expecting. So I knew that in the back of my head. And I asked myself, how was I going to make sure that I'm getting value because it takes a long time to produce a podcast, even if it's fairly raw, just booking time with guests, having the conversation, exporting it, storing it, filing it, uploading it to your hosting service, managing all like the backend marketing, et cetera. Um, That was really curious to me. And I was like, okay, I asked myself, how am I going to make sure that this, I get something out of this, regardless of the amount of people that listen, because I can't control the listenership to an extent I can influence it. I can do a better job marketing. I can create better content. Um, I can do certain things to help that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's something that I really can't control. So I defined impact for myself and um, I'm so glad I did because I don't think I would have been closing, closing now on, on two years podcasting if I didn't do that. Yeah, no, that's, that's so important. And you know, those, you talked about vanity metrics and I think, 
you know, like a lot of us are driven by that and, you know, whether it's likes on Instagram, whether it's downloads, whether it's whatever. And, you know, that's where I really had to very, very consciously uh, set an internal um, goal for myself. And to the point where I really forced myself even not to look at the numbers and, you know, it scared the shit out of me. It took me half an hour to literally hit publish on my first couple episodes. Um, I didn't even tell anybody I was really doing it. It wasn't like same big <laughs> announcement. It was just like, oh, it's going to be out in the interwebs. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Did you have that moment after you published your first one? And then like the first like 48 hours, you're just kind of like waiting for that onslaught of messages or people kind of reaching out like, Hey, listen to this. This is cool. And then like, after like two or three days, you might've heard from a couple people, but at the end of the day, like people just went about their life still. Like it wasn't like a major disruption in life, maybe a major disruption in your life. Um, and, and around your expectation. But I find that, I found that really comical, um, (laughs) that, that like, I, I let that go. It was like so much stress and anxiety around me to like press that, that publish button. And then at the end of the day, like, couple people listened. I got some good, I, I had some um, comments about it, mostly good, but everybody continued to go through. And I found that throughout the entire thing, I, I, I highly encourage people to be a creator in some sense. Um, you don't have to be, you don't have to create for the public if that's not for you, but I think you can learn a lot through, um, I was kind of talking about these side projects or spending a little bit of time in a, a different hobby or profession outside of your own. So you can start kind of learning some other skills. And, and a big thing too, that I got from podcasting is, at the end of the day, like you care more about, <laughs> about yourself than anybody else cares. Um, and there will be some people that share some feedback along the journey, but more so than not, like if you make something that's crap, you're probably got to be the only one that really knows that it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's that understanding that you're actually not as big of a piece in other people's lives as yes. you are. Um, which isn't a bad thing, right? Yeah. Which is okay, because we all have such complicated, such intertwined um, lives. And, you know, like one of my favorite quotes, and I don't remember exactly how it went, but essentially the idea is that uh, for everyone, um, you're the star of your own movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, with all the intricacies, all the different relationships, all the webs, and somebody passing you on the street is just an extra. Mm-hmm. However, their life is just as complicated, just as um, interesting as yours is. And, you yeah. know, I kind of put it in perspective and you're just an extra in theirs. And mm-hmm. it was just a really cool way for me to think about it. Um, now, I do want to loop a background really quickly here, too, because um, I, I do think it is a very important conversation of that, um, you know, not being afraid to take perceived step backs or to really pursue what you actually want to pursue, especially, you know, in your twenties, but I think in your entire life, um, you know, we talked about the privilege of being able of us being able to do that. Now, again, I'm a little bit crazy and I definitely have a high risk tolerance, but when I did that, like I had zero savings, you know, my last business venture put me into a ton of debt, like, and I've basically lived paycheck to paycheck ever since. And that has been the most interesting and eye-opening thing for me, where from the outside looking in, I'm in the worst place I've ever been in my entire life. However, internally, I feel better than I ever had. And just how important it was to see that firsthand for myself. And no, you don't have to be as extreme as me and quit everything, walk away with no plan at all. And just like, oh, I'll go get a job and I'll pay my bills. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It is so important, I think, to, to really ask yourself, you know, why am I doing this? What, what do I truly want to be doing? And can I sustain this? And that doesn't, again, to your points, doesn't need to be your career. Your career doesn't need to be everything, you know, but finding those other projects and um, stepping out and doing things that the outside world might look and question you on, or that's not how you're supposed to do things. And, you know, one for me that I was so curious when you talked about it, and that was, you know, even on our um, our intro call when we, when we chatted quickly was the idea of having a sabbatical as a 20 something year old. And I can only imagine, you know, the questions and the looks and the feedback that you got. Um, and so I'd just love for you to expand on that a little bit of what allowed you to follow through, even though I imagine so many people around you were basically either implicitly or explicitly telling you that you're crazy for taking a sabbatical at such a young age. Mm-hmm. Well, first and foremost, now that I've taken a sabbatical in my 20s, I 
if you can make it, once again, this maybe is coming from a position of privilege, but if you can make it work, I think everybody should consider a sabbatical of some sort throughout their 20s as just a good checkpoint. A, um, gives you some white space to really think about it and get out of the day to day and maybe realize, oh, my job isn't as good and or isn't as bad as I thought it was now that I've really just kind of taken a step out of it and, and gotten caught up on a lot of like the just daily grinds of what is life. And two, so many of us have goals or other pursuits that we would love to spend more time in if only we didn't work. So creating a sabbatical really gives us or allows allowed me to put some energy into some of those so I can get them jump started and ready to go so that they're more so in maintenance mode um, come the time I was ready to work again, you know, i.e. my podcast. That first few months getting everything going and really getting it streamlined took way more time than it does now. Now that I'm, I'm back in the workforce, I can really balance the two of them. I'm not sure if I could have balanced launching a podcast and starting a career at the same time if it wasn't for that. Going back to your original question now of kind of the looks or what people were thinking. I mean, maybe it, it goes back to what we were talking about right before that too. And just being like, you know what, I'm at that point now that I realized I'm player one in my, my own um, life, but I'm just an, I'm just an extra in, in other people's life. So regardless of what I ended up deciding, it might just be an immediate thought, but probably nothing that anyone's got to take a lot of like, I'm not going to tell somebody that. And it's got to sit with them for like three weeks after that. Like it does with me, like people are going to like, Oh, that's weird. Or like, Oh, that's a little crazy. Or that's like a terrible idea to like be taking off six months during these like prime years of, of your career. Um, especially at like where you're going. But for me, ultimately I decided I needed to do this. This was something that I wanted to do. Um, the only person I really had to manage in that process was my dad. And that comes back to our, our, you know, conversation around achievement driven and him really, having and putting so much pressure around the importance of having a job and really understanding what that meant to him. And that's being self-sufficient and taking care of yourself because he came from this situation where he didn't grow up really rich. He had to pay for school because um, mom, his mom and dad didn't really have a lot to support him with. So he paid for school. It took him like something crazy, like seven or eight years to finish school because he was kind of in and out full-time, part-time, because he'd have to go work to have enough money to pay for another semester of school. So really kind of understanding where he's coming from, um, I think is important and managing expectations there. And then manage that. Go. To, I went to my dad. He was one of the very first people before I made that decision. Hey, dad, this is what I'm thinking. I really value your opinion. What are your thoughts? Honestly, listening to those um, and, and taking those in and then responding to them politely, knowing that um, it's is my dad's probably always got to look at me as his son, but now we're at that point in our relationship that, that we can be almost peers that we're both adults and he trusts me now. Um, and he trusts me now because I've continued to involve him on some of these decisions, explain my line of thinking, um, respond to some of his, uh, you know, potential consequences that what, what he thinks might be potential consequences that might come from that decision because more times than not, like my dad's right about a lot of things. He's like, how the hell you got to, pay for six months, a, a six month sabbatical. Okay, dad, well, I saved up this much money. Um, this is what I plan to do with my time. This is how I'm going to speak to recruiters about my time off whenever that time does come, like all the obvious things that he cares about. And once he saw that I went through all of that, it wasn't a big deal for him anymore. Um, responding to others outside of that wasn't a big deal for me because I'd made so many changes, big, big changes that had had so much pushback, like moving out of St. Louis, um, leaving certain jobs. Uh, I just left that, that job after five months. I had a lot of people like, what the hell are you doing? Um, I also, you know, had to change the thing on LinkedIn that I'm not working there any longer too. So I was a little nervous about what that would be. Cause I know I just had this announcement like five months before, like, oh my gosh, I'm starting a new job. Really excited. Like would love to connect uh, with people about what I'm doing now. And then I was thinking like, what are people going to think five months later when I'm like having this post about I'm taking some time off. I really want to explore what I'm, I want to do with my life. Like that was a really hard line of thinking for me to think through. But at the end of the day, most people got it. Like when, when you really think through and people know it's coming from good intent and that you're making this decision because you know you should be making this decision and not because somebody else is driving you towards that decision or not. I think people respect that. Mm -hmm. I, th I think at the end of the day, a lot of people are like, would 
wish they could make some of those those decisions um and maybe they just don't have the courage or they feel like they have restrictions around the decision they can make etc but more times than not people were really excited about what i was doing they were curious they were uh they were pumped for me and um maybe that came because i had some plan i really kind of thought through some of the consequences and and i was doing some of the work that i set out to say i was going to do you know i was like hey i want to work on these two professional goals of mine and I also want to explore my career. And this is what exploring my career looks like. I'm going to have conversations with people that are in my um, targeted career paths. And I had like two or three of those every single week. So every time somebody was kind of asking me about the sabbatical, I always had some kind of update on like what I was getting, some new insight, you know, a new potential thing that I want to try out. And once again, I, I stopped kind of talking in these absolutes. Like I'm trying to find my dream career. I was just trying to find my next job. Like I was just like excited, like what was going to be next for me? <laughs> so I, I don't know if that answered your question, but that was kind of where I was at headspace wise. No, that's huge. And, um, you know, a couple of things that I think were really important is, you know, the, fir the first one being going in with intention and like actually doing it for a reason um, and taking action, right? Like a sabbatical wasn't just you going out and partying for for six months, you know, trying to find yourself. No, you're actually taking actions to work towards the goal that you had set or, you know, working towards um, the outcome that you were looking for from it. Um, you know, on especially your father, you know, the idea, and I think a lot of times we have turned into thinking that it's all black and white. Either you're with me or you're against me. Either you're on my team or you're on the other team. And getting to a place where you're able to agree to disagree of, you know, I hear, I hear your feedback. I'm going to take it in. I'm going to look at it. And, you know, um, that might be true for you. It might not be true for me and that's okay. And respectfully taking that in, it doesn't have to turn into a fight. You don't need to convince everybody that it's the right decision. And I think that's where a lot mm. of this energy go is to know I need to convince every single person that I care about in my life that I am doing the right thing right now, yep. instead of just going out and actually doing it. Um, and, you know, just to add a little bit for myself, because I really, it sounds like you, you're able to handle other people's opinions very well, which is amazing. Like for me, I struggled with it a lot. And luckily, making these big decisions in my life, I was able to same sort of thing that most people will support you. Most people support you. Most people be curious about it, at least um, they'll at least wish you well. And feeling that encouragement, those good feelings, um, from the majority of people really kind of shows sometimes the relationships that aren't as good from the people that try to put you down or tell you that you're wrong or you know you're stupid you're making the wrong decision and you're able to see that contrast and a lot of times you're able to see that it's all coming from within them of either mm -hmm. it makes their life harder or they've always wanted to do it and now that you're actually doing it they're jealous deep down and whether they know it or not and so that that was really cool for me um now we are getting short on time but there is one other thing i want to ask you about um because i think it's really interesting the idea of giving advice or being considered an expert at such a young age um you know of I think one thing that people struggle with a lot is that I don't have the experience yet. I'm not old enough to actually give out advice. And, you know, um, I see that you give and do a lot of talks on either finances or career planning and stuff like that. Um, I'm curious, just your journey with that quickly of have you gotten pushback from it? Was there ever, you know, a mental barrier for yourself of like, you know, am I qualified to give this advice to other people um, and how you got over that? Mm -hmm. The quick answer would be yes. <laughs> um, it's hard. It's still a challenge for me, to be honest. I have some imposter syndrome around some things that I'm asked to talk on or rooms or virtual calls that I get to be a part of because I see so many people with so much more years of experience than I have. And that could be a challenge. And knowing that, feeling that, accepting that, realizing it's okay. Um, but then also the value and the input that you can provide to that conversation as well. Me being 28 with a group of 50 plus people or 50 year old plus um, um, speakers, I realize in that situation that I provide such a different or maybe unique perspective. Maybe I don't have the years of experience that might, you know, you can see some of these decisions play out or you might see history up and down. So you might not know like, hey, that 
we talked we talked about that 30 years ago that that that's not really applicable advice because it's going to come back to bite you here but at the same time having some of the ageism or the wisdom of this group of audience because i'm i'm at at heart uh, very very curious and a big time learner i like to listen to a lot of podcasts, read a lot of books, and honestly, just have one-on-one conversations with people that have knowledge to share. Utilizing that, cultivating that with like my current experience as well, I feel like allows me to be somebody that is in a position to offer support. And maybe it's rephrasing that. It, it, maybe it's not advice, but it's support or ideas. You know, lots of, lots of times I caveat when I'm having conversations as this is what worked for me. Maybe this can help generate some potential solutions for you. Um, everything that you share doesn't have to be the Bible. Um, and, and knowing that and realizing that, um, might allow you to actually share what's worked and potentially help somebody. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so before we wrap up here, is there anything that we didn't get to anything that you want to talk about at all? Dude, I I feel like we could talk for hours, (laughs) but I think we did a really great job this last hour covering so many good topics. Awesome. Um, and then, so if people want to connect with you, uh, or follow what you're doing, where would be the best places? Um, where can they find the podcast and where can they find you specifically? Yep. So you can find the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. We're on all the major podcast players. Um, the, the, my show once again is the struggle is real with Justin Peters. Just search that you'll find the yellow, uh, yellow logo. If you're somebody, you know, our, my podcast is catered towards 20 somethings. Um, it's really talking about the things that we never really had the chance to fully explore and or learn through throughout college. Um, so everything from relationships to personal finance, to health and wellness to your career, the micro topics with inside of those are what I like to talk about. And it can range from high level philosophy on some of that, those topics all the way down to tactical. So, um, you know, what it means to be a respectful participant in a conversation to how to address a difficult conversation, um, kind of that bridge between the two, because I, I think you have to get meta enough so that it's applicable in all situations, but also you got to see it tactical enough um, to be able to like have a starting place or, or kind of a usable piece of, of um, uh, feedback to, to start with and try. So that's the struggle is real. And if you want to connect with me, easiest way to do that is on Instagram. I'm at Justin Lee Peters. Awesome. And we'll make sure to link those uh, down in the notes here, but thank you again so much for being on. Really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, Really excited to see what you have in store. And uh, I know that our paths are going to cross again. Yeah, it's been an absolute blast, Jared. Thanks again.